Welcome to the Tuesday Bible Study in the Gospel of John. We're going to talk today about the last episode in the making of the mosaic that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Now, so I can be sure we're on the same page. Uh, if I had you in class, I'd be doing this. So I, I want to be sure we have, we're all on the same page. In these episodes that form the mosaic, that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. There are three groupings of people that he's going to have to be Savior to. He's going to have to be the Savior to the Jews. He's going to have to be the Savior to the Samaritans, part Jew, part Gentile. He's going to have to be the Savior to the outright Gentiles. Now, both of those would be qualified as Gentiles, the Samaritans and the outright Gentiles. But at the same time, I think there is distinction between the two. And so he must be the Savior to the Samaritans, and he must be the Savior to the outright Gentiles. Now, to become the Savior to Israel, to become the Savior to the Jewish people, Jesus must fulfill three things from Old Testament prophecy that comes into the New Testament. One, he must fulfill the promise of the temple. Now, the promise of the temple is simply this. God comes to meet man, and man comes to meet God in the temple, especially in the Holy of Holies. God comes to meet man, and man comes to meet God. That's the temple promise. Second, he must fulfill the covenant relationship and by the way, Jesus did this in the cleansing of the temple. In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus simply said, destroy this temple, talking about himself, and in three days, I'll raise it up. He fulfilled the temple promise. Second, he must fulfill the covenant relationship that he had with Abraham that extended all the way through, including the inner biblical period, all the way through to John the Baptist in the New Testament. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, the first of the New Testament prophets. However you choose, he was that bridge prophet between the two. In the story of Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a covenant relationship with God that he has established because of the promise to Abraham, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus got into a dialogue with Jesus. Interestingly enough, he got into a dialogue with the Jews in the temple. He got into the dialogue with Nicodemus. He gets into the dialogue with, about John the Baptist. But when it comes to this last one we're going to talk about today, he doesn't get into a dialogue much at all. So he fulfills the promise of the covenant relationship in Nicodemus by telling him, you must be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So Nicodemus apparently responds to that because he shows up later to help take care of Jesus as he was crucified on the cross. So here's Nicodemus, fulfillment of the covenant prophecy. And then John the Baptist, he must be the fulfillment of the prophetic utterances of the Old Testament. Those prophecies, Jesus must fulfill them. And if you'll study through the Old Testament from reference to those prophecies, Jesus fulfills every prophetic message given about him in the Old Testament. Now, if he's going to be the Savior to the Jew, all three of those must be fulfilled. The temple, the covenant, and prophecy. Next, he must save the Samaritans. Chapter 4 is the story of the woman at the well of Jacob in the little town of Sychar. 
Uh, not much of a well, deep, but not much of a well. Not overly impressive, the town of Sychar. But here's Jesus, and he engages the woman at the well. You know she finally responds. by They get into a dialogue. She says, you worship on Zion, I worship on Gerizim. Jesus said, we need to get on the same page. There is coming a day when you worship only in spirit and in truth. The woman came to Jesus and went back and brought out the whole town. And they stayed there for a few days longer. Jesus is Savior to the Samaritans. Now we come to this last episode, this last encounter. I want you to pick up with me in chapter 4, beginning with verse 46. Chapter 4, beginning with verse 46 of the Gospel of John. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. Now that's interesting. He's coming, he came to Cana the first time and performed a miracle. He comes to Cana a second time and performs a miracle. Both of them in Galilee, not in Judea, where he made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him. Now, if you're an underliner, you ought to underline those words. He went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. He was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman gave the most curious answer. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, or my boy is going to die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now that's the first part of the episode of the nobleman and his son. When Jesus sees this nobleman who is so intense on doing something for his son, when I read this for about the third time, it finally pierced my understanding. There is another parable that Jesus tells where the man gets company at night. He doesn't have adequate bread to feed them, goes to his neighbor's house, knocks on the door. His neighbor says, go away. I'm in bed. Don't want to be bothered. The man kept knocking until the man got out of bed, got out of bed and gave him some bread. As he got out of bed and gave him some bread, Jesus wants us to understand there are some times in life you just have to keep knocking at the door. You just have to keep knocking at the door. I've heard the testimony of a number of people in the life of this church who told me about someone in the church that came to their home. They didn't receive Christ the first time didn't receive Christ the second time, but the third time, the Holy Spirit of God touched their life. And they were saved. Been in the church ever since. Been a leader in the church ever since. When we know and understand that there's sometimes we need to just keep knocking, that's what this nobleman is doing for the sake of his son. He is not going to be pleased until he gets an answer of some kind. I need for you to do something about my son. He's dying. And Jesus says to him, you're doing this to see signs and wonders. Now this man's testimony is awfully interesting to me. Here is a Gentile nobleman outside of anything that looks like Judaism and Israel. And this Gentile comes and says, 
I want you to know that you're the only one that can help me in my situation. Jesus said, all you want is signs and wonders. Listen to what the man says. He's not like the Samaritan woman. He's not even like those in the temple. Jesus simply says, he says to Jesus, except you be signs and wonders, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, I've told you before, I'll say it again. Come down, or my son is going to die. Now Jesus puts him to the test. He says to him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Is that not for you an amazing story? Here is a man outside the realm. He knows nothing about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, and that meant the shed blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. All he knew that Jesus had some supernatural power and his boy could be saved by the supernatural power of God through the ministry of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not going to give up. And when Jesus challenged him, he simply said, I'll go. And he left and he went. He started home. And Jesus was absolutely amazed, as I am amazed, at this man's faith. Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word and went his way. Now pick up at verse 51. And he is, as he was now going, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. The man inquired the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, about the seventh hour, the fever left him. Verse 53. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he's come out of Judea into Galilee. This is such an amazing story. It's just almost breathtaking, this nobleman and his faith. His servants were so excited that his son was still living and was making progress, was getting well, or was well, that they hastened and they met somewhere between, somewhere between Cana and Capernaum, somewhere they met. And they said, your son is alive. The nobleman said, when did it start? About the seventh hour. And he calculated, that's the same time Jesus told me that my son was going to live. He went his way. All of his household believed as Jesus performed this second miracle in Cana of Galilee. Now, let's take that stone and let's polish it like we have the others. The polish of the Jews. This is what Jesus did in being the Savior to the Jews. Polish to the Samaritans. This is what Jesus did in the life of the Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob. Polish this last stone. Here's what Jesus does to an outright Gentile. To an outright Gentile. No evidence of a background. Just outright polish that stone. Now fit it into. And do you know the mosaic you get? Do you know the picture it paints? This is one of the most exciting places in Scripture for me. The most exciting place in Scripture for me is are these five episodes that lead to the understanding 
Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Friend, if you are a Jew, you will be saved through Jesus Christ or not at all. If you are a Samaritan, you will be saved through Jesus Christ or not at all. If you are an outright Gentile, you will be saved through Jesus or not at all. What an amazing thing. He's the Savior of the whole world. Don't go looking for plan B. Don't go looking for some alternate route to get to God. There is no alternate route. I, I, I wish I could speak to every person in Florida, every person in Jacksonville. There is no alternate route to God except by the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone. That's why he lived a sinless life, died an agonizing death, came victoriously from the grave because of salvation that can only come through Jesus. Now that's hallelujah for me. That's a wonderful understanding for me. I don't have to do this to add to it. I don't have to do this to add to it. I do this because of it, and I do this because of it. I don't serve God because I'm going to build browning points with God. I serve God because what He's done for me in terms of Jesus Christ, His Son. Well, I can get a little excited at this point about this episode and this nobleman. I find myself in the nobleman. I find myself in him. I had no background. Jesus came into my life. Totally changed my life. Talk about transformation. I was transformed from that which I had already been conformed to because of Jesus Christ. Well, as I said, it was one of the most exciting discoveries I ever made in Bible study here in John's Gospel. Now we move into a whole new section in the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. And that's where Jesus begins to enter into controversies, especially with the religious leaders. Now, some of you have an outline on the Gospel of John that I gave you at the beginning of the study. We are down to Roman numeral number three, four controversies that indicate increasing opposition to Christ. Now, for you note takers, you'll want this, four controversies that indicate increasing opposition to Christ. That is going to be found in chapter five through chapter 10, verse 42. Chapter five, 1 through 10, 42. Now, I have tried to break this down, and I'll try to be conscious of it and give it to you each time with each controversy. I want to talk about the, this first controversy, by the, by the way, is in chapter one, 5, 1 to 6, 1. The occasion, the healing of the lame man. I will try to give you the occasion for every controversy that exacerbates opposition to Christ. Two, what is the issue? Why does he get into trouble? Three, the discourse that goes on between Jesus and the antagonist. And then the interval, this third visit to Galilee in chapter 6. Now let me go through those again. I just need you to have this fixed in your mind. Under each controversy, I'm going to try to cover these things. I'm going to try to be faithful to the task. One, what is the occasion of the controversy? Here, it is the healing of a lame man. What is the issue that gets Jesus into trouble? Three, what is the discourse that takes place between these, the antagonist and Jesus? And number four, what happens next? Watch the next interval, and then we'll pick up the second controversy. Now, as we get into this controversy, this mounting hostility toward Jesus begins in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. 
After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know what feast it is. I read different accounts. Some thought it was the feast of Purim, which is the feast that celebrates Esther and her words, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. This could be my day. Could be that feast. Could be the Feast of Trumpets. Could be the could be any feast. I don't think it is the Feast of Passover. I don't think enough time has lapsed for the Feast of Passover. It could be the Feast of Pentecost. Jesus goes up to a feast. It's an amazing as you get into the study of Scripture, especially the Gospel of John, how many things happen as Jesus gets involved in a feast. We'll see that as we go. So the third day, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was at Jerusalem, at the sheep market, or some say at the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, the Seda, having five porches. And these, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whatsoever then first, whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he might have had. Verse 5, And a certain man was there who had had an infirmity 38 years years. Now let's look at this background of this man. It's almost inconceivable what we might find. By the way, if you would go to Jerusalem now, I think where they take you to show you Stephen's Gate would be approximately the place where this pool was in the day of Jesus. It's a little obscure what they talk about now at this pool of Bethesda, or Bethsaida. And so here is this man, this ancient gate, waiting for something to happen. Now some texts do not place chapter, uh, verses 3 and 4 in the text. I don't know why, they just don't. I do. I believe there was something happening here that caused people to stick around to stay. If the waters were troubled and a person got in the water and they were not healed, chances are no one would have stayed, especially for 38 years. We don't know in this 38 years. you realize this is half of a lifetime? Half of a lifetime. This man had been at this pool trying to get well. I, I don't know his circumstances. I don't know whether they brought him every day and put him there or whether he lived there. It seems like from the text, he had lived there for 38 years. And now that in itself is an amazing thing. I jotted down some things. This man knew everything there was to know about poverty. He is surrounded every morning when he gets up and every night when he goes down. He is surrounded by people who are as sick as him or maybe some of them even sicker than him. Surrounded by them, never getting away from them. This misery that he must have known, hopeless poverty, saw no future whatsoever. Do you know what many people tell me about life in the United States today? The one thing that we're seeing in the rise of suicide, especially among teenagers, seeing a rise in addictive drugs, the opioid conflict, seeing a rise in so many things, is there a sense of hopelessness? There is a sense of of hopelessness. Now for God's people, that should never happen to any one of us. This man saw no future. He saw only hopelessness. In all likelihood, he's seen his friends die right there. He'd been there 38 years. 
38 years. That's inconceivable. So here he is, and when the water is troubled, he has no way to get into the pool. Now look at verse 5. Jesus relates the actual event. This man seemed to be the most hopeless case of all. He asked him a very interesting question, by the way. Jesus asked the man, be about the business of accepting people in those different areas of our life. Now, verses 7 and 8, he's going to talk about judging people. Now, this is a bad habit if we're not careful. We just get into judging people by trying to make them like us. Let's not do that. Let's try to make them like Jesus. Let's try to help them overcome rather than just judgment. You remember Jesus, they brought the prostitute to him. And Jesus, the only time we find in scripture, Jesus writes, I don't know what he said. I don't know what he wrote. But whatever it was, he saved that woman's life and told her, where is everyone? Who's going to cast the first stone? Judging is a terrible habit. Now there are seven different judgments for you note takers. I'm going to do this in a hurry, so you're going to have to write in a hurry. There is a judgment of sin on the cross. There is number two, the self-judgment placed on the believer. Number three, there is the judgment seat of Christ. Number four, there is the judgment of nations at the coming of Christ. Number five, there is the judgment of Israel. Number six, there is the judgment of angels. This is an interesting one. It's in the book of Jude, verse six, the judgment of angels. Number seven, there's the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. Now these are the judgments that come. Now let's stay within the confines of these. Let's not become one who judges everything that comes down the pike. Well, I say everything. Every person who comes across our path. We don't need to be in the habit of judging. We need to be in the habit of accepting. You can be different from me, and I'll still love you. I hope I can be different than you, and you still love me. That's what love is all about. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love. Help us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.